Okay, I gotta get going fast because last week I finished six books. Six books, don't be impressed. I didn't read all six books in one week. I finished six books in one week. So let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> hey Booktube, it's Kim at Middle of the Book March and this is my bookish week for Saturday, February 5th. I have a cheat sheet over there, over there. Um, welcome, and yes, I finished six books last week. I, again, disclaimer, I didn't read them all. I didn't start and finish six books. I finished six books. I had multiple books going at once, and they all happened to finish all at the same time. Uh, you know, there's a couple that, one of them was an audiobook that had been going for a couple of weeks. You don't need me to explain. You get what I'm saying. So, yeah, I'm going to get going quickly. What I'm going to do is start with my least favorite and end with my most favorite. One of the six books was a BookTube Prize book. I am judging translated fiction in Group A. And I did finish one book so far, so I won't even tell you what that one is. And I'm I'm going to do things a little differently this year. I'm not going to show you the books that I've read or finished for the BookTube Prize until we do our final wrap-ups for each round. So once the Octo Finals have been announced, then I'll do my impressions video. That's what we'll call it. So... Out of five books that I'm going to talk about, my least favorite is um, Minor Feelings, an Asian American Reckoning by Kathy Park Hong. Kathy Park Hong is a Korean American author, and this is her book talk. It's a series of essays talking about what it's like to live as a Korean American and an Asian American in the U.S. And it was a great start, and it was a pretty good finish. Um, Huh. It was a really good start of her thoughts growing up in the family that she grew up in. And she talks about Asian American stereotypes. She talks about Asian immigration and her parents' attitudes coming from Korea versus living in the U.S. And the things that they did change and the things that they held on to from their own culture. She talks about what type of parents they were. And she talks about their parenting style compared to some American parents of um, the author's friends and that type of thing. So she does a lot of compare and contrast. She talks so much about uh, stereotypes of Asian people that Asian people are quiet. They are agreeable, submissive, intelligent, uh, ambitious. The stereotype are, is that Asians are the preferred minority or compared to black Americans that Asian Americans are kind of um, the next white people. And she is very upfront about, she knows that the stereotype is there in this country, that Asians are actually favored. They are a favored minority. And the title Minor Feelings um, is peppered throughout the book. And she's talking about the, what she sees that happens in the U.S. and how she feels being Asian and being Korean. So it was a really good start. I was really enjoying these essays and she's very honest and very raw and at times very emotional. So if you are a white person that is living with white fragility, you need to get over yourself and read the book, move on. Uh, it's, it's not you know, who cares if our feelings are hurt? Who cares if your feelings are hurt? Um, just read the dang book. It's not about uh, her, put, you know, pulling apart white people. It's about her giving you her feelings and her thoughts on her living as an Asian woman. It gets to the point where she starts talking about art and art history and her experiences coming out of art school and the, the artists that she knew in the city her experiences as a college student. At that point, it stopped being about her Asian experience in the U.S. and started being about name dropping a bunch of artist names, uh, which was extremely esoteric for me. And that word I asked three booktubers about because it was on the tip of my tongue for days and I couldn't figure it out. Anyway, unless you were familiar with artists in the art world, it just went right over my head and she kind of lost my interest at that point in the book. And she kind of ended in that way. She went back to her original topic a little bit, but it kind of was mostly wrapped up in art and artists talk, artists speak, 
and I kind of lost interest. So that's that was my least favorite of the week. Now, unfortunately, my next, my fourth favorite, I feel like I'm doing a booktube prize rundown. I finished Manifesto by Bernadine Evaristo, and this is a very short memoir in essays of her life in writing and um, her family. This is an interesting uh, memoir because it's super short, and it is she's talking mostly about her writing life and her creative creative life. She touches on her family. She was the oldest, I think, of six children of a Nigerian father and a white Catholic mother. So her parents in the 50s were an interracial married couple, which was rare and an anomaly, especially in her neighborhood. They lived, I think, right next to a Catholic church, Catholic school. They attended a Catholic church. And so her bi her biracial self and her siblings were always looked on in the neighborhood and in the church and in the schools as different and odd. And she talks, she talks about that, but not in a lot of depth. She talks about her love of literature as a child and how she grew to love uh, writing and creating and drama. She was, she went to drama school, extremely artistic, creative young woman. And so she leads into how that led into her writing career. She talks about her young adulthood and different relationships, her bisexuality, um, talks about when she started writing her novels and that creative process. The book is divided into sections, and so she talks about each part of her life in a different section. The first one is her heritage and childhood. Then she talks about the homes and the apartments that she lived in. And the third one is her women and men relationships and so on and so on. So it's a weird way to divide up a memoir, but these are basically essays. And I was not that fond of that format. It was a very non-linear format for a memoir. And I, again, I have to say it wasn't really a true memoir in that it was a documentation of how her early life led up to her creative life. Some of the things I truly just did not like, and she's a person who believes very much in the power of positive thinking. She mentions that many times. And her sense of resilience, and her sense of she's not going to take no for an answer. She, she at one point says that she probably could have <clears throat> um, benefited from therapy, but she doesn't believe in therapy to kind of work through her earlier life. Um, yeah, that one struck me wrong, and it, it was almost like, I understand for her, but it it gave more gravitas to her, to an attitude of therapy is unnecessary, and people should just be able to pull themselves up by our bootstraps. Much of the memoir was very trite and cliche, and I just, it didn't work that well for me. I really loved hearing about her life, and how she became who she was, how she got to the point where uh, she wrote Girl, Woman, Other, which won the Booker Prize in 2019. And I, I enjoyed all that. I enjoyed the facts of her life. The writing was very plain and very, it was fine, but it wasn't the way she writes her novels. So it, it was, it was okay. I didn't love it. It was okay. Uh, my the third favorite book of the week is called uh, Sitting Pretty, The View from My Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body by Rebecca Tossig. This I listened to on audio. And this one, this book was great. She is a disabled author who's been using a wheelchair since the age of three. Uh, when she was a baby, she had uh, cancer. And due to cancer treatments and medical treatments, she became paralyzed at three years old. Now, I think I was just, I was wrong because she, her parents did not get her a wheelchair right away. So as a very young child, they basically told her, learn how to get around. And she did. She actually got around a lot by crawling on her hands and knees. And her knees were always scraped up and scabby and and in pain. And so for a very long time, her parents treated her like a, a uh, her other siblings in that they didn't really kind of give her the things that would make her mobility easier. 
So she learned quite a bit about getting around, about existing in a world not really friendly to her, her disabled body. Eventually, she did end up with a wheelchair, and she talks very much in this book about living in a wheelchair. Um, I love the book because she narrates it, and she's very, she's funny, but she's also very honest about living in a disabled body in an able-bodied world. She talks a lot about mobility and relationships, talks about romance, and she talks about why she got married the first time. It's a series, again, a series of essays and chapters talking about her life, but this memoir was much more successful than Manifesto. I was so, um, I, I felt educated and I felt this was so illuminating for me to hear her firsthand accounts of her life of living in her body and how to get housing and how she got an education. She's an independent person. She lives, she lived independently. She lives independently. And I thought this was really good for me to read. If you're looking for books written by disabled authors talking about ability and disability and living in the world, this is a good one to pick up. Number two for the week is I'm Still Here, Black Dig Dignity in a World Made for, Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. Austin Channing Brown is a Christian Black woman. And in the book, she talks about her parents. Why did her parents give her a white guy's name of Austin? And she was so weirded out by that for a long time because she talks about all through school when everybody, when the teachers called attendance, they were looking for a boy named Austin. And when she raised her hand, they did a, a second glance and their eyes kind of opened wide. And she went to her parents and she said, why did you give me this name? And they looked at her very plainly and said, we wanted your name to appear on a job applic application so you would have a chance to get to the interview. And I thought that was really profound of how this black woman lives in a white world. And again, this was a series of essays and memoir. She discusses um, be, being in a white world, being in a world that is not friendly to her, that is not there to lift her up into success. She talks about um, being in ministry in a church. She talks about the levels of prejudice and racism that she's finding even in the church uh, because, you know, so many people think churches are bastions of hopefulness and, and love and support, and they're not. And to, to me, from my church experiences, I really enjoyed hearing that perspective of her. She kind of is behind the curtain perspective. Um, she talks a lot about uh, her job and how she rose into management and what that did to the people that worked under her. She became a teacher of of race race relations and diversity training on the job. She discusses hostility that she had to deal with. She discusses not only being a woman, but being a black woman, teaching uh, a diversity training. There's so much here that um, just she clears things up. She cleared things up for me as well. And I loved the tone of her writing. Um, this is not going to be a favorite for everybody, especially if you're not a church person. She does talk a lot about God's love and ministry work and church people, um, the black church versus a white church. And there are some pretty substantial differences, cultural differences. And there's a lot of discussion about her experiences as a Christian. I love the book and I thought it was excellent. And uh, again, another one that if you want to hear that perspective, um, definitely pick that one up. I really liked it. And I think I gave that one five stars on Goodreads. I really did love it. And uh, it was good. It was great. Now, the last book, this was my first five star book of 2022. And I had heard of this book from so many different people. Finally picked it up. This is Old Filth by Jane Gardam. Jane Gardam is an... Uh, a UK author, and she's got a bunch of books out. And this was my first five star of the year. And after I finished this book, I proceeded to buy the next three books in the in the series. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. This book was published in, I think, 2004, 2004. And this is the story of Old Filth. And 
filth stands for failed in london try hong kong he is a british um barrister who becomes a judge and he and his wife travel from the uk to hong kong he works in the court systems and as a lawyer um talks about his experiences as a young boy his past he was kind of a what they call a raj orphan his parents were stationed as civil servants in um southeast asia and so they were in the india pakistan area of the world eventually singapore and as civil civil servants so many european parents sent their children back to europe or back to um england to stay with relatives or whoever would take them so they could continue to serve for the british government this discusses imperial british imperialism colonialism and is just spectacularly written her writing is just it blew me away i thought it was sublime i loved his character i loved his character she writes in flashbacks and so we read about him as a young boy and the experiences of his childhood we it starts you know we read about his birth and um how he ended up traveling all over the world how he ended up you know being born in in one country and being sent to england knowing nobody except distant relatives how he lived how he survived who were the people that he loved and that he was surrounded by um how he met his wife and their relationship their marriage and it basically you we end up with him as an elderly man and his retirement from the law his decisions that he makes the way he lives and secrets from the past i have markers in here because there were so many passages that i thought were so beautifully written um let's see one of them is he was on the train sopped through with oxford's rain he watched the tangled hedges threaded with the dead spirals of last year's weeds her writing i just thought was just so brilliant and beautiful this one, as he stood beside the grave and thought of his long life with Betty and his achievement in presenting to the world the full man, the completed and se successful being, his hands in their lined kid gloves folded over the top of his walking stick. He was aware of something somewhere. He looked up at the sky, nothing, yet he was being informed, no doubt about it, that there was something in him unresolved. He was inadequate and weak. If they knew, they would all find him unlikable despicable face it and there's so many passages that i thought it's just it's gorgeous the writing is is gorgeous and inventive and funny he's he can be extremely funny as a character and his life was interesting the his emotional repression um the reason why he was so closed off emotionally and what that did to his marriage uh, what that did to his, the people that, he, the children, the other children that he grew up with, and do they have relationships in their adulthood? Um, it's just, I absolutely love this book, and it was so interesting because I wanted to read a five-star book. I wanted to find a, a good one for 2022, and this was the first one. One more passage. From the top of the gangway, the east hit him full in the face. The thick, glorious heat washed onto him and around him, lapped his swollen old hands and his tired feet, bathed his old skull and sinewy neck, soaked into his every pore and fiber. Life stirred. Just absolutely gorgeous writing. Um, I, I thought it was brilliant. And it was very easy for me to start to read the very beginning of the book and think, I'm not going to like this. This is lifting up imperialist uh, England at the time. And um, what is this going to tell me? And how is this going to talk about Southeastern Asian people? And how is this going to talk about Indian people and the Indian government? Um, but the book redeemed itself. And she has so much, there's satire and there's commentary and her thoughts and attitudes about that period in history and i just absolutely love the book and i can't wait to read more from her so that is it one last book i finished from the book two prize in translated fiction not going to talk about that one Phew! i think i did all right <laughs> i think i did all right i'm filming on friday it's freezing rain here in my area of new hampshire i'm waiting for the snow to come to cover it 
I don't know if I'm going to get three to six inches or six to 12 inches. Have no idea yet. But uh, yeah, that's it for my week. I got to stay home and work from home today. I'm very happy about that. And yeah, if you've read any of these books, let me know what you think. Write a comment down below. And um, that's it for me. I'll see you sometime next week. And thanks for watching. Bye, everybody.